Jeff Greenblatt is uh, from Lucas Wave International, and he is an author of many books and educational programs. Uh, he's a lecturer. He's been interviewed on a lot of radio shows, also a regular columnist, a weekly columnist for uh, uh, Futures Magazine. I don't know if any of you have uh, uh, read his articles on there, but he's got a lot of uh, great content. So if you go to FuturesMag.com, you can uh, search for him and, and read some of his past uh, article postings that he's uh, that he's written as well. Uh, so he's very highly respected. Even in and and one of the things that I like about Jeff and is his approach to presentation. I know a lot of this uh, material, such as Gann and Elliott Wave and Fibonacci, uh, and Lucas, is a little bit out on the fringe for more conservative uh, approaches to trading. And so, and for many people, it can it can seem a little bit out there uh, and hard to implement and uh, and what I li love about Jeff's approach is it's it's very practical and it's very pragmatic and down to earth and and he's got some really great research behind uh, behind his approach to trading so uh, I know he's spent a lot of time on this presentation today so I'm, re I'm personally looking forward to to hearing what he's got to present for us as well well uh, thank you were you talking about me <laughs> Okay. You're very kind. Thank you for having me. Well, you know, gang, today's 9-11, and all I'm going to say about that is I think we're very lucky and fortunate to be able to be doing our thing at this particular point in time. I know there's a lot of politics and other issues going on in the world. As far as, you know, I'm not a political guy. I'm a socionomic guy. I'm an, a, a social observer and... I think that everything that happens out there in the world um, is, re is a reflection of what the stock market is doing. I'm a, a firm believer in the uh, hypothesis that the stock market firmly reflects uh, the mood of the crowd from extreme optimism to pessimism. So I stay away from politics and I'm into social observation. So with that being said, we're going to get into this presentation. But I just wanted to uh, make a, you know, say my thing about 9-11. Anyway, what we are going to be doing today is taking um, our presentation beyond Fibonacci. Now, I know that there's a lot of people out there who, let's say, and I know you had Pesavano on here, and all respect to Pesavano, he's one of my mentors as well. But what I've noticed uh, in the last, well, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, uh, it was a domain of elite traders. But now, I and mean, you turn on CNBC, do you hear them talking about 50% retracements? You hear these guys talking about, these fast money guys on TV, they're talking about Fibonacci almost every day. Well, it's wonderful. It's great for them. But once the crowd learns it, it's not the elite, cutting-edge type of methodology that it used to be. I can't explain it, but once the crowd knows too much about it, it doesn't work the way it used to work. So what Matthew was telling you, yeah, I am a little bit out on the fringes, but the... Uh, the bottom line for me is that I always like to stay two or three steps ahead of the crowd, and by the time the crowd figures out what we're doing here, we will be on. And that will probably take five or ten years anyway, but by the time uh, they do it, we'll be on to something else. We're always going to be ahead of the crowd. We're always going to be dealing with uh, a significant edge in financial markets, and what you're going to get today is we're going to, where others, where other Fibonacci seminars are, that's the end all, the end game. This is our foundation because we have different creative uses for Fibonacci numbers as well as geometric numbers. And in our time today, we're going to give you enough information in two hours that you can start to make use of some of this stuff. So basically, what we're going to do is talk about cycles and symmetry. We're talking about Fibonacci numbers, Lucas numbers, geometric and GAN, uh, price and time squaring, percentage change readings. It's interesting 
how important percentage change readings is, but over 90% of the trading community doesn't even realize or understand or whatever the significance would be. They just don't do it. From there, we're going to also uh, get into uh, median lines, pitchforks. I don't know how many of you uh, understand pitchfork methodology, but um, Andrews was a guy who supposedly took $50 million out of the market in his career using pitchforks. And when I heard that, it, it, it got my attention. And, I, and I'm a big proponent of that simply because, number one, it's a universal methodology. And number two, it's very visually pleasing and allows you, the trader, to have a much better understanding of that pattern that's sitting on your screen. We're going to talk about range squaring the time, which is one of GAN methodologies. Uh, we're going to introduce some of the square of nine. This is not a square of nine uh, webinar, but I, I want you guys to have an awareness that some of what I'm doing is based on that, and we're going to talk about how to profit from all of this. So, I think it was Malkiel about 30, somewhat 30, 40 years ago, that wrote a book called The Random Walk Down Wall Street, and uh, as a market timer, um, We've declared war on, on random walkers. Because, uh, I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard from the, the, from the Wall Street crowd that you can time markets, and it's impossible to time markets, and you need to be invested. And I know here we're basically uh, preaching to the choir, but even in the technical community, I think that market timing and uh, understanding the importance of the time dimension is a missing factor to a lot of people because turns can be anticipated in advance and there's a, a misunderstanding of that because once I once in my progression and I know some of you it might be new to you once you you get this new toy that you understand that there's symmetries in the marketplace then you think, wow, the market's going to it's going to hit 34 bars, it's going to hit 55 bars, it's going to hit 161 bars. I better go, you know, if it's if it's a rally, I should go short. Well, the thing is, it's a, it's a double-edged sword. On the one hand, it's a great thing because we can anticipate turns in advance, but on the other side of the coin, we have like like Matthew said, I'm very pragmatic and we need to see market proof that it's validating what the cycles could be telling us because cycles are nothing more than forks in the road. Those of you in New York if you're, or wherever you, are, wherever you have the, the subway or the Amtrak, think of a cycle point as a stop along the train and the train can elect to stop there or the express that goes on to the next, to, to the next station. And what this does is eliminates the need for lagging indicators. And you won't see, in, in, back in, my, in, in the early phase of my timing work, we did have MACDs in my book, and it was basically written to introduce people to timing work. And we, uh, we, we used the timing work with the, uh, the oscillators just so you could make the oscillator more effective. But it's gotten to the point where I don't need any lagging indicators. I don't use any of them. And in my work, the 262-week uh, the pivot at the bull top was anticipated six months in advance as the most important. I started writing about it uh, in April 2007 that I saw that uh, there was a very important pivot that was coming up. And if anything, I, you know, months in advance, you can never tell if a cycle is going to invert or not. All I told people at that time was that there was a, a very important pivot coming, probably the most important pivot of the decade, and, well, I was wrong. It turned out to be the most important pivot of our lifetime. And what you're looking at is the bull market from this decade. And anybody who had read my book, I mean, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure this stuff out. And maybe I did get a little bit lucky with this. But the bottom line is, from October 2002 bottom, until October 11th, uh, 2007, it turned into 262 weeks. 
and that's the, that was the top, the end, and we've been in the bear market ever since. So when we're looking at common Fibonacci formations, you just had Pesavano. I'm sure you guys are familiar with this. This is your very common ABC. Now what you're looking at is the final leg up to retest the high in, uh, in, from August to October 2007 in the Russell 2000. Very ordinary, very common. Uh, a is 60% of the whole move from the low uh, compared to the C wave. Okay, but what I do is look below the surface. This is the exact same sequence. I'm looking for the uncommon relationships under the radar. And what we have here in terms of calendar days is the Russell top was on July 13th. The market top was on uh, October 11th. You had 90 calendar days. Now on this screen, you're not going to see 55 and a half, but you are gonna, that, that was calendar days. You're looking, at, you're looking at actual trading days. But the bottom line is, is from that low to the high, you had 55 and a half out of 90 calendar days, and you can do the math. It's a 61% time retracement. And that's where everything turned to the bear market. So the only reason I'm showing you this slide is so you get your mind accustomed to not taking what you see on the chart as face value, digging one level deeper. And in the next two hours, you're going to see we dig a hell of a lot deeper than that. And this is just the, uh, the calculations, 90 days, time retracement, and it clustered uh, by the time the smaller 90-day cycle completed, it turned with the Dow at the all-time high at 262 weeks. And um, so one of the most important rules that we have, and this is not something that I invented. This is something that Dan invented. Uh, if, he, if he invented, he popularized, is that when price and time square, the trend changes direction. And that's the rationale and the reason for most of what I'm going to show you today. And so what I do is that I look at every particular leg. And what we do is we take price and time, and we square it to get a ratio. That ratio is going to dictate whether we are close to or at a turn. And depending upon how many pivots the, the cluster is, and you'll see when we get more into this what I'm talking about, how strong that pivots are going to be. And we also use per percentage change readings as an important part of the equation. 